Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Tuesday, September the 8th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Philippians chapter 1 and 2. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the, in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is our continuation of Article 5 on love and fulfilling the law, or we could call that sanctification, or we could call it the gospel, beginning in paragraph 112 in the Reader's Edition. Unity cannot last is necessarily dissolved whenever the bishops impose heavier burdens upon the people, or when they have no respect for weakness in the people. Dissensions arise when the people judge too severely the conduct of teachers or despise the teachers because of certain less serious faults. For then another kind of teaching and other teachers are sought after. On the other hand, perfection, i.e. the church's integrity, 
is preserved when the strong bear with the weak, when the people put up with some faults in the conduct of their teachers, and when the bishops make some allowances for the people's weakness. The books of all the wise are full of these teachings about fairness, namely that in everyday life we should make many allowances mutually for the sake of common peace. Paul teaches about this frequently both here and elsewhere. Therefore the adversaries do not argue carefully from the term perfection that love justifies. For Paul speaks of common integrity and peace. Ambrose interprets this passage in this way, just as a building is said to be perfect or entire when all its parts are fitly joined together with one another. Furthermore, it is disgraceful for the adversaries to preach so much about love while they don't show it anywhere. What are they doing now? They are tearing apart churches. They are writing laws in blood and asking the most merciful prince, the emperor, to enforce them. They are killing priests and other good men if any one of them has slightly indicated that he does not entirely approve of the clear abuses. What they are doing is not consistent with their claims of love, which, if the adversaries would follow, the churches would be peaceful and the state would have peace. This turmoil would be lessened if the adversaries would stop being so bitter about certain traditions. These traditions are useless for godliness and are hardly observed by those very persons who most earnestly defend them. The adversaries easily forgive themselves, but they do not likewise forgive others according to the passage in the poets, I forgive myself, Mavius said. But what they do is very far from those praises of love that they recite here from Paul. They do not understand the word any more than the walls of a building that echo it back. They cite also the sentence from Peter, Love covers a multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4.8. Peter also speaks of love toward one's neighbor because he joins this passage to the rule that commands love for one another. No apostle would have imagined a. our love overcomes sin and death, and b. love satisfies God's wrath and reconciles us to God while excluding Christ as mediator, and c. love in and of itself is righteousness before God without Christ as mediator. For this love, if such a thing could exist, would be a righteousness of the law, not of the gospel. The gospel promises reconciliation and righteousness to us if we believe that, for the sake of Christ, as reconciler, the Father has been reconciled, and that Christ's merits are given to us. Peter urges us a little before to come to Christ that we may build upon him. He adds in 1 Peter 2.6, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. When God judges and convicts us, our love does not free us from confusion. But faith in Christ frees us from these fears, because we know that for Christ's sake we are forgiven. Besides, this sentence about love is taken from Proverbs 10.12, where the complete opposite clearly shows how love ought to be understood. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. This verse teaches precisely the same thing as Paul does in Colossians. If any dissensions would occur, they should be moderated and settled by our fair and patient conduct. Dissensions, it says, increase by means of hatred. We often see that tragedies arise from the most trifling offenses. Certain petty offenses occurred between Gaius Caesar and Pompey. If one had yielded a very little to the other, civil war would not have arisen. But while each gave in to his own hatred, the greatest commotions arose from a matter of no importance. Many heresies have also risen in the church only from the hatred of the teachers. Therefore, this verse does not refer to a person's own faults, but to the faults of others. When it says that love covers a multitude of sins, it means those of others. Even though these offenses occur, love overlooks, forgives, and yields to them, not carrying all things to the extremity of justice. Peter, therefore, does not mean that love merits the forgiveness of sins in God's sight, or that it is an atoning sacrifice excluding Christ as mediator. He also does not mean that such love regenerates and justifies, but that it is not gloomy, harsh, and uncooperative towards people. It overlooks the mistakes of its friends, while it deplores the harsher manners of others. A well-known saying puts it this way, No, but do not hate the manners of a friend. Nor did the apostle thoughtlessly teach so often about this office what the philosophers call leniency, epiakeia. For this virtue is necessary for keeping public harmony in the church and the civil government. Harmony in the church cannot last unless pastors and churches mutually overlook and pardon many things. 
From James 2.24 they cite, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. No other passage is supposed to be more contrary to our belief, but the reply is easy and plain. If the adversaries do not attach their own opinions about the merits of works, the words of James have in them nothing that is unhelpful to us. But wherever there is mention of works, the adversaries add their own false, godless opinions. They say we merit the forgiveness of sins by means of good works, that good works are a satisfaction and price on account of which God is reconciled to us, and that good works overcome the terrors of sin and of death. They also say that good works are accepted in God's sight on account of their goodness, and that they do not need mercy in Christ as reconciler. None of these things came into James's mind. Yet the adversaries defend such teachings like this passage of James as an excuse. First, we must consider that the passage is more against the adversaries than against us, for the adversaries teach that a person is justified by love and works. They say nothing about faith, by which we receive Christ as reconciler. In fact, they condemn this faith, not only in sentences and writings, but also by the sword and capital punishment. They endeavor to exterminate it in the church. James teaches much better. He does not leave out faith or present love in preference to faith, but retains faith, so that in justification Christ may not be excluded as reconciler. When Paul forms a summary of the Christian life, he also includes faith and love in 1 Timothy 1.5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Second, the subject matter itself shows that the works spoken of here follow faith and that such faith is not dead, but living and effective in the heart. James did not believe that we earn the forgiveness of sins and grace by good works. After all, he is talking about the works of those who have been justified, who have already been reconciled and accepted, and who have received forgiveness of sins. Therefore, the adversaries err when they conclude that James teaches that we merit forgiveness of sins and grace by good works, and that we have access to God by our works, apart from Christ as reconciler. Third, James said a little earlier that regeneration happens through the gospel. For he says in James 1.18, of, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. When James says that we have been reborn by the gospel, he teaches that we have been born again and justified through faith. For the promise about Christ is grasped only through faith, when we set it against the terrors of sin and of death. James does not, therefore, think that we are born again through our works. From these things it is clear that James does not contradict us. He criticized lazy and secure minds that imagine they have faith, although they do not have it. He made a distinction between dead and living faith. He says that faith that does not bring forth good works is dead. He also says that a living faith bring forth brings forth good works. Furthermore, we have shown already several times what we mean by faith. And we will continue with that thought tomorrow evening. We now join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. 
from all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death. Good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Merciful Lord, you sent your Son, Jesus, into our world to humble himself by becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Teach us to be obedient so that we might declare with St. Paul that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, and so that our lives may be worthy of the gospel of Christ through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.